Hi, I'm Jonathan Jones. Uh, I've got a talk coming up called Pathological Intimacy, How Microbes Attack Plants and How Plants Fight Back. So I'll be telling you about um, kinds of plant diseases, I'll be telling you about uh, kinds of uh, ways in which pathogens attack and get into plants, and um, I'll tell you about various levels of resistance mechanisms uh, that enable plants to detect pathogens and turn on the appropriate defences. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to have a chance to meet the next generation of leading plant scientists, which is, I'm sure, what you all are here. But it's a very um, daunting task uh, because you, you, I don't normally uh, lecture to undergraduates, so I've, I'm, I'm guessing uh, about what level to pitch it at. Um, um, but uh, the most important thing I'm going to be trying to do is to get across uh, certain absolutely key concepts uh, in and trying to understand how plants resist disease and how micro microbes circumvent uh, that resistance. So here, this may look a bit of a, a, a tangential thing to refer to, but um, you know, you've all heard of the sensitive plant, and here's a sensitive plant, and um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to behold, and of course it's got this name, the sensitive plant. Uh, and and it's, I always find this slightly irritating, because in fact, all plants are sensitive plants. Plants perceive what's going on in their environment uh, and adjust their growth accordingly. And they also uh, turn on a bunch of responses to help them resist disease where they're under attack, uh, or, or uh, from diseases or, or also from pests. So um, my way of sort of getting across, I think, some of the key concepts in the field, here's the uh, points I'm going to attempt to make. I can tell you about plant disease in a sort of fairly general sense and the types of plant pathogens. And then I'll get into you know, the various things, you, questions you may have about uh, plants and their interactions. So I'm going to start off with how pathogens get in and you know, start causing a problem. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, resistance mechanisms and also say a little bit about this plant pathogen simply because it's so important. And there's a lot of other science of plant microbe interactions which I'm not going to get into, like systemic acquired resistance or uh, jasminate signaling uh, for insect resistance, just because you can't do everything. Um, but a lot of the content in what I'm going to be telling you, uh, you can find in a chapter that I uh, contributed with Kim Herman Kozak to this book. And also the key concepts can be found in this book, which I just happen to see uh, down there on the list of, set of books that you've got. So chapter eight in here will also cover uh, a, a lot of the content that I'm going to go through if you want to read uh, more about it or if there's something uh, you, know, you felt you missed that was interesting you'd like to get clear. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we sort of plant microbe interactions in general. So not all interactions between plants and microbes uh, result in disease. Uh, <clears throat> So these kind of, uh, of course, this is a, a, a disease example here. Um, over here, you've got some more classic symbioses. So uh, rhizobium bacteria colonize nodules of legume, uh, roots of legume plants and make these nodules within which nitrogen fixation can occur. This is particularly advantageous to plants on nitrogen depleted soils. Uh, and then there are these fungi called um, uh, vascular, uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae which um, uh, have a very intimate relationship with plants and facilitate their uptake of phosphate. And there are some other sort of more curious examples. So Epichloe is a fungus that grows in ryegrass, and it, it seems that by making a lot of secondary products that are poisons for uh, animals, it actually deters browsing uh, uh, of animals on the plant. So this is essentially a symbiotic interaction, but it's a big problem for sheep farmers in New Zealand um, because lolium gets colonized by these uh, epichloes that make compounds that are actually rather toxic uh, to sheep. But nevertheless, not all plant microbe interactions uh, result in, in disease, as in this example here of rice blast on rice. Um, <clears throat> but one of the more important diseases of plants uh, <coughs> uh, is this uh, late blight uh, caused by phytophthora infestans that affects um, potato and tomato. <coughs> and the remarkable thing about this disease is that uh, from a, a small colonization within a field, within a couple of weeks, the field can be just completely wiped out, you know, turned to toast. <coughs> uh, so an important thing to know about 
this particular type of organism is it's not a fungus. People, you'll often see it in newspapers, the fungal disease, Phytophthora infestans, late blight. Actually, if you look on this uh, tree of life here, so here's Phytophthora. It's more closely related to brown algae <coughs> and to things like malaria <coughs> than it is to, uh, or even to plants, uh, than it is to fungi. Uh, in fact, humans are more closely related to fungi uh, than uh, Phytophthora is. And, and we feel so strongly about it in the, in the plant pathology field. We've got t-shirts made that have this little uh, phylogenetic tree here. Uh, and on the back, uh, more interestingly, this is the way to remember it. <laughs> Bats are not birds. Dolphins are not fish. Oh, my seats are not fungi. So the fact that we've gone to the scale of making t-shirts about it tells you how strongly we feel about this important issue. Um, but a lot of important pathogens are fungi. And, and the way to think about what's going on in a leaf that has been colonized, it's, it's a bit like you know, on a petri dish, microbes make these uh, mycelia. So you've, the fungus uh, uh, makes these sort of thin filaments, um, scepter between them. <coughs> Here's a, this is a long, thin cell. You get uh, branching. So, and you get this extensive colonization of a petri dish here with a uh, fungus growing on it. And it's essentially the similar kind of thing is going on within a leaf. Uh, that results in, in enough nutrients being stolen from the host to give you spores that can then propagate the, uh, the, the disease to uh, um, uh, colonize another host. And the remarkable thing is if you've got this much stuff growing uh, on you, how don't you know it's happening to you? Um, so, so these are very stealthy pathogens. Uh, and, th and they evade detection and also they suppress uh, defense mechanisms. So what's key uh, for many of the uh, um, filamentous eukaryotic pathogens, such as fungi and oomycetes, um, <coughs> is uh, uh, the fact that you can elaborate these projections into the host cell called Holstoria. And what these do is they increase the surface area of intimate contact between the pathogen and the host. And, and there's, a, there's a tremendous a uh, set of transactions going across this uh, boundary between them. There's, there's two membranes, there's a host membrane, and, and then there's a pathogen membrane. Um, so molecules are being pumped in by the pathogen to suppress defense, and sugars and so on are being sucked out. <clears throat> so the, these hostorial uh, feeding structures called hostoria, single hostorium, uh, are key to this, this relationship. Uh, and um, powdery mildews, and powdery mildews are fungi, uh, they also make these very elaborate, in fact, these are extraordinary, these are like little aliens within the cell, uh, that, uh, you know, and that you've got tremendous uh, increase in surface area with these finger-like projections at the end. And, and you get these um, uh, sort of white, fluffy uh, uh, sets of spores that are um, that derived from the colonization. The remarkable thing about this pathogen, the powdery mildews, is it only grows in the top layer of cells, in the epidermal cells. It doesn't actually even get into the uh, cells where all the sugar is. But nevertheless, you, you um, oh, when the sugar is being uh, photosynthesized, I should say. Uh, but nevertheless, you can get tremendous proliferation. Uh, and uh, uh, these, these conidia uh, then spread the pathogen to other uninfected plants. And there's a little more of a cartoon of the Horstorium. Um, so again, I said the, the, there's, there's two membranes here. There's the, uh, uh, the horstorial membrane, and then there's a, a, a space between them, and then there's a, a host uh, membrane around the outside. <coughs> and um, this is topologically, um, this is, is not actually in the host cell. It's within the host cell wall, but it's outside the host cell. But there's this uh, very extensive interface between the two uh, I guess shown in, in more detail uh, here. To get in, this pathogen and many others um, have developed something called an apressorium, and it's, uh, uh, this is basically a stiletto heel or a stiletto type. Uh, you, you, it, tremendous force is exerted that forces it through. Uh, some of you may have heard Nick Talbot about this, Talbot talk about this. <coughs> um, you get hydrolysis and a big turgor pressure in this that forces uh, the uh, infection peg through into, uh, into the host. And the third major, I've talked about downy mildews, 
Uh, in fact, Phytophthora infestans is a late blight pathogen. There's a downy mildew. I've talked about the powdery mildews, the ones that just colonize the cell surface. And the other major, major class of plant pathogen is the rusts. Uh, so for example, here are th three different species of wheat rust, leaf rust, stem rust, and, and yellow rust uh, caused by basidiomycete fungi unlike the ascomycetes that cause the uh, powdery mildews. These also make horstoria, and these are the source of uh, tremendous crop losses. And you know, a theme that, that I will, will sort of reiterate a bit is that while relatives of our crops are actually a terrific source of new genes, additional genes for disease resistance. <coughs> so uh, wild e elops, brachypodium, uh, etc., can be, uh, th these wild grasses can be investigated for whether or not they carry genes that we can then use to improve our crops. Of course, because uh, at least brachypodium doesn't form crosses with um, uh, wheat, it can, uh, you'll need to use the GM method to, uh, to bring the resistance gene in. And uh, here's another example where the same method is being applied. So soybean rust is an interesting uh, disease called Asian soybean rust, first defined um, in, in Japan. Uh, <coughs> It's been spreading across the world. It went and spread via Africa. And about 15 years ago, it blew in to Brazil. Uh, uh, spores blew across the Atlantic. And now it's a $2 billion problem uh, on soybeans uh, in, in Brazil, <coughs> uh, it fostered in part by the agricultural practices of you just, as soon as you harvest one lot of soybeans, you're planting the next uh, into where you just harvested. <coughs> And uh, we and colleagues have identified genes in, in uh, a, a tropical legume called pigeon pea that confer resistance to Asian soybean rust. And if you get it out of pigeon pea, put it into soybeans, you've got a resistant soybean. So if you can ring, go, go around that loop a few times, you could bring in a, a set of resistance genes that might give you durable resistance to, to this disease and, and avoid having to spray $2 billion worth of uh, fungicides. Um, now, not all uh, plant pathogens make these uh, horstoria. Uh, this is just uh, one of a number of uh, fungi which manage to just grow in the intercellular spaces of the leaf, the, 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 uh, the apoplastic extracellular spaces uh, of, of any uh, leaf in the mesophyll. Uh, and the fungi just grow uh, in these spaces. It's not entirely clear how they're um, uh, well, the basis for their nutrition, but there's enough sugars leaked into these spaces that they can then eventually emerge and sporulate uh, and uh, uh, propagate their life cycles. Um, so I've talked about uh, diseases that have a relatively uh, intimate um, association with their host, uh, and indeed it's not in their interest to kill the host. But that's not true of all plant pathogens. So some plant pathogens are classified as necrotrophs and some as biotrophs. So the biotrophs are what the ones I've been telling you about. They need a living host to complete their life cycle. Whereas the necrotrophs uh, will um, make often toxins, uh, some of which are also poisonous to humans, uh, that disable the defenses and, uh, uh, and kill the, the host and enable the pathogen to, to feed on the consequences, uh, on the, uh, sorry, on what's uh, leaked out of the dead cells. So I, I like to show this way of, of putting it. So um, the, the biotrophs, if you will, are like blackmailers. So the last time, last thing you want if you're a blackmailer, making a nice living is for your source of money to die. So uh, your biotrophs, re they require these living hosts to complete their life cycle. And I've shown you some historical pathogens. So um, the, the, the alternative, the necrotrophs are uh, cutthroats. They will... Um, uh, eliminate the life of their target and uh, grow on, on uh, uh, what's left. So Botrytis cinerea is, is a classic uh, um, necrotrophic pathogen uh, and it kills its host uh, and uh, um, grows on the contents and, and sporulates rigorously. And this slide also, it, this is now a Arabidopsis. That, this is a, a wild type, you know, non-mutant Arabidopsis that has been infected uh, with, with uh, this necrotrophic pathogen, uh, Botrytis cinerea. And although you, you, if you look hard enough, you can see a bit of uh, activity and effectiveness of the pathogen, the plant is actually fighting off uh, the pathogen reasonably effectively. But if you disable one of its components of its hormone signaling, 
uh, involved in the ethylene response uh, in, in Arabidopsis, you can see how disabled this plant is for, um, uh, for immunity to this pathogen. And this makes another general point, uh, which is that even if you've got an infected plant, it's still mounting as much in the way of defense uh, as it can. It's not actually sufficient to completely thwart the pathogen. But the reason you know that there's a lot of defense going on even in infected plants is you can find mutants where uh, the, that type of defense has been disabled and then those plants are even more uh, susceptible. Uh, I mentioned this, this uh, feature of toxins. Uh, so <coughs> this, this over here is a, a, a pathogen called uh, Claviceps purpurea and it is erg causes ergot of rye. And, uh, in, the, in the Middle Ages, sporadically, you'd have these um, sort of so-called dancing sicknesses of, uh, uh, of whole villages where if the ergot had gotten into the, uh, the grain, uh, there's, there's a compound closely related to lysergic acid diethylamine, um, which is really, really, uh, and, and it gives you a nasty surprise if you eat it uh, in, your, in your loaves of bread and, and whole uh, villages went nuts. But also it... it um, the compounds uh, in this fungus can cause vasoconstriction and people lose limbs and so on. Um, now, infections by pathogens and pests have all sorts of dramatic uh, effects on their uh, host. This, I think, used to be a, a carrot, but it's infested with root knot nematodes. Uh, and there's plenty of examples of dramatic growth disturbances uh, associated with infection, either by uh, uh, organisms like nematodes or by fungi. <clears throat> uh, a couple of uh, com uh, important concept about insects. So there's basically two kinds of insect, uh, uh, the insects that attack plants. So there are those that eat stuff up, you know, Colorado beetle or um, all the caterpillars that you might have seen on your uh, cabbages. And then the, the alternative is, is the uh, suckers. So you get aphids that stick a little stylet into the phloem cells and uh, extract uh, uh, sugar without killing the host. This is essentially a more biotrophic uh, insect uh, than, than this. And or I should say also that these, uh, these insects, uh, part of their problem, part of the sort of problems they cause is for the, through the transmission of viruses, which then go on to cause uh, much more serious problems usually than the insect itself. So a lot of important plant diseases caused by viruses uh, and also by uh, bacteria in addition to the fungal diseases and the uh, mycete diseases that uh, I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so this is um, papaya, uh, and this is papaya infected with the papaya ring spot virus. And this actually is a resistant plant that has been engineered um, in a public sector program 20 years ago or so now to uh, make small RNAs that target the virus. So the, all of the papaya that you eat that comes from Hawaii uh, is uh, genetically modified to express small RNAs that prevent this virus from replicating on it. Um, so when bacteria infect plants, where, where do they grow? So if you've got a, a fluorescent protein labeled bacteria, you can see that its position uh, uh, corresponds to where you get lesions that emerge uh, as the disease develops. And, and the bacteria, rather like that fungus I mentioned earlier, grows in these intercellular spaces and um, there's all sorts of biology on how the, the bacteria know when there's a high enough concentration of bacteria uh, through sen quorum sensing, through, through detecting the presence of other bacteria, and then it switches on a whole program uh, that enables it to overwhelm the host. Um, another very important bacterial disease uh, that I'm, uh, I'll just go through because it's one that, that plant biologists use all the time uh, at least the kind of plant biologists uh, I talk to. Uh, it, it, the, the, the disease was, was, uh, is caused by a bacterium, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, and it makes a disease called crown gall. And the, why, what, why do you get uncontrolled growth of plant cells that have experienced Agrobacterium? It's because those plant cells have received DNA from the Agrobacterium that perturbs hormone uh, metabolism, usually uh, through elevated expression of auxin uh, and cytokinin. So <clears throat> the agrobacterium <clears throat> has evolved uh, a DNA delivery system that put DNA into plant cells that uh, actually evolved 
from bacterial conjugation. So bacteria can move plasmids from one bacterial cell to another by a process called conjugation. That's how bacteria have sex. So um, basically these bacteria have evolved to have sex with plant cells and they deliver uh, this DNA in the course of that and, and impose uh, uh, crown galls on it. And, and what uh, scientists have done is to identify the mechanism uh, that's by which this DNA is delivered, uh, the so-called virulence genes uh, that define the transferred DNA, uh, that where it starts and stops, and, and package it up and get it across uh, these two cell walls, the bacterial and the plant cell wall. Still mysterious how it gets through the plant cell wall. Um, and so by uh, taking advantage of these DNA delivery mechanisms, but replacing the transferred DNA uh, properties of hormone perturbation and replacing it with your favorite gene, you can put any gene you want into a, a, a plant cell. And then with various tricks, you can select for plant cells that have received the DNA you want and, uh, um, and, and have them grow and, and differentiate a whole plant. So this is just sort of a little distant evolutionary perspective on uh, uh, plants and animals and immunity. Um, Plants evolve multicellularity independently of, of animals. Uh, uh, probably, uh, uh, and, and the, the plant and animal uh, uh, taxa split according to this phylogeny. I don't know what the current favored number is, but in 2002, the favored number was about 1.6 uh, billion, year, uh, billion years ago. Um, so if you're a, uh, a single-celled organism, your requirement for defense or the kind of uh, organisms that can grow on you are very different than in a multicellular organism. So if, you've got multi if you're multicellular, then you've got a lot of spaces between cells that bugs can get in that you don't have if you're single-celled. So they will have had to independently evolve uh, uh, resistance mechanisms, although there's quite a lot of commonality uh, in what they came up with. Um, so among the set of defenses that plants have, uh, they make reactive oxygen species like hydrogen peroxide or superoxide. Uh, there's a dedicated enzyme to do this. Uh, plants in defense <coughs> against these pathogens can secrete uh, uh, antimicrobial peptides. Um, they also uh, can induce molecules or the biosynthesis of molecules that are uh, antimicrobial. Uh, that sometimes they're called phytoalexins. And also, and you can imagine this is particularly useful mechanism against those pathogens that require a living host, uh, they, can uh, uh, they can implement what's called the hypersensitive cell death response, or hypersensitive response, or HR. It's often shortened to. So um, reactive oxygen species, antimicrobial peptides, antibiotics, cell death. And this is just a, a cell death response uh, shown by uh, these fluorescent compounds that accumulate as the cells die when this pathogen uh, is trying to get into a resistant host. Uh, <clears throat> so how did this um, cell under attack by this pathogen that's trying to enter it uh, know to turn on all these, these defenses? And I'll, I'll be getting to that uh, uh, later. Um, so this is uh, an, uh, so a few more examples of this. So this is if you've got a resistant Arabidopsis against a downy mildew, you can reveal uh, uh, where cell death is happening uh, with a, with a so-called with tripan blue staining. So living cells exclude the dye, dead cells uh, accumulate it, and so these are where all cells are either dead or dying, where a pathogen is trying to get in. Um, tobacco that's resistant to tobacco mosaic virus, all these lesions here are due to the pathogen uh, the virus is starting to replicate, activating defense. The virus escaping to the next cell, defense activated, and eventually uh, um, the, the defense catches up with where the virus is, and there's enough cell death for the virus to, to uh, stop proliferating. And of course, viruses are almost the ultimate biotrophs because they really need a living host uh, to replicate. Uh, I mentioned uh, reactive oxygen species. So there's a stain we can use to see reactive oxygen species. It's called uh, diaminobenzidine. So here we got uh, this diaminobenzidine staining where uh, defense is being activated. <coughs> and we know um, some of the components that are required for this to happen. 
There are genes called uh, respiratory burst oxidase homologs. <coughs> uh, nice little, little name. So we call them um, RBOH genes for short. And what these do is they're, they're remarkable enzymes um, that uh, have six transmembrane domains. Uh, they they uh, cover um, a, a cell membrane. And what they do is they convert um, uh, this compound, or uh, well, they, they take electrons from this compound, and it, they, it travels through uh, this, this tube, basically, made by this protein. And these electrons, electrons then get dumped on oxygen to make superoxide, and superoxide then breaks down to make hydrogen peroxide. And if you've got a mutant in this particular gene, RBOHD, here, then you can see how the staining that you have in wild type just goes away because you've lost the capacity uh, uh, to make, uh, uh, for this process to be uh, implemented. Now I talked about detection mechanisms, um, and detection mechanisms in the plant uh, of pathogens are often encoded by what for historical reasons are called uh, resistance genes. So these resistance genes have been used by plant breeders <coughs> um, either through conscious or unconscious selection uh, from the earliest uh, days of, of, of uh, agriculture. And they, uh, they encode immune receptors that detect something from the pathogen. And then if they detect it, then defense is activated. But one of the uh, frustrating things for plant breeders is, you know, you can, you can identify some new source of resistance and you back cross it uh, to, some, uh, let's say, your favorite wheat that's got terrific yield uh, several times. So that after enough back crosses, it's, you've got that wonderful wheat but with a resistance gene in, and then you start planting it, and it does really well. Um, and then the pathogen evolves to overcome that resistance gene. Uh, and then the resistance gene doesn't work. And this is called the, and then you need a replacement resistance gene. This is called the boom and bust uh, cycle. And actually, we, we, what we're hopeful of, and, but this hasn't ever been achieved yet, but I think we can see our way clear that we might be able to, is uh, ways of breaking this boom-bust cycle and just staying up with the boom. That's where we want to be. <coughs> so uh, resistance gene encode immune receptors. There's, there's basically two kinds of immune receptors. There's one that acts at the cell surface. Uh, and detect molecules outside the plant cell, and there's one that act within the cell that detect pathogen molecules that get into the, uh, into the cell. So I'm going to start off going through uh, the cell surface receptors. So uh, a while ago, for, well, actually for a long time, people have been studying molecules from pathogens that seem to activate defense. Um, and there was a lot of descriptive work that said, okay, you know, this molecule, this glycan or whatever, turns on defense, and, and people got stuck with that. People couldn't get at the mechanism. Um, but the key uh, to getting at the mechanisms was, was being able to exploit genetics. And this was first achieved with a particular molecule from pathogens that activates defense, and it's called flagellin. So bacteria have these uh, flagella, that's how they swim. These flagella are remarkable structures. They're polymers of many, many uh, copies of this protein, flagellin. Uh, and, he, and, and, and it forms a, a filament. So here's a molecule of flagellin. It's, uh, uh, it's one, of, one, one of the components of this uh, set that make up the filament. And flagellin has within it a small peptide, uh, uh, this amino acid sequence. And, and basically, this is quite conserved across uh, bacteria, uh, across most bacteria. This peptide activates defense. So then what was done was to look for mutants that no longer responded to this, and then to clone the gene. And what was uh, uh, identified was this gene called flagellin sensing 2. And it recognizes this flagellin peptide. It has a, a protein motif that is uh, um, called a leucine rich repeat. Uh, it's a, it's a well-defined uh, uh, structure now, for, and it's present in many uh, uh, proteins that interact with other proteins. Uh, and the solution rich repeat domain here uh, is, has a transmembrane domain, and then there's a protein kinase domain inside. <coughs> and um, when you activate this, a bunch of magical, magical things happen, and defense responses are activated. And this is important, because it turns out that um, if you look at a, a, a mutant for in FLS2, it's uh, significantly more uh, disease-resistant 
uh, sorry, it's, it's significantly more disease susceptible. I think it's this one here compared to wild type. Um, and so this is genuinely contributing to the resistance um, of the plant. So here's, maybe it's seen more easily here. So here's an FLS2 mutant. Here's a wild type after it's uh, been inoculated with, uh, uh, with Pseudomonas. And you can see there's a lot more symptoms because there's more uh, bacterial proliferation. And you can see the same sort of thing here compared to this wild type. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of these uh, cell surface receptors in plants that are important for immunity. Some of them uh, sense this uh, uh, peptide from bacterial uh, EFTU, a, a, an elongation factor involved in translation. Again, very well conserved uh, across bacteria. Uh, and then there's uh, other receptors that recognize uh, chitin, uh, which is a cell wall component of essentially all fungi. And uh, this is again is a, is a pathogen that the plant, the, the, a, a molecule that the pathogen can't help making. And then there's a set of protein kinase uh, uh, activations that result in a, a, a defense response. <clears throat> so th there's more detail about that. Th th there's a, a lot of, this is now a bit of alphabet soup, which I probably don't want to uh, go through in detail, but there's a lot of components. Uh, have, have, that are downstream of this activation by flagellin uh, have now been identified. And in particular, there's a cell surface uh, a pro leucine retropeat kinase called BAC1 that is absolutely required for uh, this flagellin uh, response, for this FLS2 to work. So upon flagellin provision, uh, this molecule and this molecule, which are previously separate, come together and that uh, induced proximity then uh, is responsible for changes in the protein kinase activity of these bits inside and the chain of events uh, that gives you defense. And, and what's very interesting about this, and this is, I think, exciting from the standpoint of controlling plant diseases, uh, is that <coughs> you can move these recognition capacities from one plant uh, to another. So different plants have different pattern recognition uh, capacities. And these can be moved between species if you've identified the gene that confers recognition of a specific molecule. So uh, Rabidopsis, uh, in fact, all the Brassicaceae can recognize this EFTU via uh, EFT, the EFTU receptor. It turns out that tomatoes, uh, Solanaceae, in fact, most other plants do not have the capacity to perceive this bacterial molecule. And if you take the Arabidopsis gene uh, into uh, tomato, then you can confer resistance to bacterial diseases. So this is the disease that results from Wollstonia solanaceorum, bacterial wilt. <coughs> if you've put in the Arabidopsis EFR gene, then suddenly you've got elevated resistance and essentially you've got no symptoms, uh, at least in this experiment. So this is now, uh, uh, I think, got, has got great potential for enhancing the recognition capacity of our uh, crop plants and, and thus elevating resistance. Because plants have got really great defense mechanisms. I went through them, active oxygen, uh, programmed cell death, antimicrobial peptides, secondary products. And the way that a pathogen succeeds uh, is to avoid the activation of these defense mechanisms either through not being uh, evading perception or by shutting down those defense mechanisms. So what this tells you is if you can increase the perception capacity of a tomato for bacteria, then its endogenous defense mechanisms will take care of uh, sub sub reducing losses to that disease. So, but nevertheless, uh, um, I've told you about this great mechanism, pattern triggered immunity. Uh, you can detect these molecules that pathogens can't help making, like chitin and flagellin. Um, nevertheless, you get disease. So what's, what's the trick? So uh, <clears throat> the trick is to deliver proteins that are called effector proteins from the pathogen into the host. Uh, and and pa uh, bacterial pathogens, including pathogens of uh, humans and other animals, uh, have developed this, this uh, secretion system called the type 3 secretion system. It actually evolved from the mechanism to make uh, flagella. Um, and what you can see here is uh, these, these uh, pili that are produced when you activate the type 3 secretion system, the pseudomonas. And you can actually detect by immunolabeling in these experiments 
proteins uh, uh, such as AVRPTO uh, that have been delivered or are being delivered in the electron microscope uh, image here. So uh, bacteria deliver effectors through this type 3 secretion system. There's a, a, a mechanism that elaborates this pillus and uh, effectors can then actually get through this again th out of the these pili have to go also go through the plant cell wall somehow or other, and that's really not understood. Uh, and, what are, and when they get there, they somehow or other inactivate defense. I should say um, fungi and <laughs> oh, my seats. Um, also deliver effectors. And, and all we know about them really is that they, uh, uh, they got a signal peptide for getting out of the um, uh, fungus or mycete, and then somehow or other they get into the host cell uh, possibly across that sort of intimate interface that is the Hostorium. And uh, you know, it's, it's still a very active area of research to understand how these, these proteins get in. And then, okay, so uh, the, the, what do they do when they get there? These bacterial type 3 effectors at least have been, many of them are well defined. You, these ones here, this may look like, uh, uh, this. Well, I'm sure it does look like alphabet soup, but these are different effectors that have been shown to inactivate various components of the, uh, chain of, of, of the uh, signaling proteins that participate in the chain of events between detection of the pathogen here and activation of immune responses here. So it's been a, a, a very um, active area to identify the function of the bacterial effectors in particular, but we're doing the same now with omicete and fungal effectors to try and understand what bit of the plant defense they're, they're shutting down. But for, as I say, for a number of them, it is pretty clear where they're hitting in this, in this chain of events to compromise uh, immunity. So we've got this pathogens then are really brilliant at shutting down host defense. How come there are any plants uh, uh, left alive? Oh, I'll come back to that, sorry. I want to say a bit about other effectors. Not all effectors suppress immunity. Some of them do something uh, uh, more subtle. So, uh, and this is a very interesting uh, story so uh, the, the effectors that are recognized by some plant resistance genes uh, carry a, a set of repeats uh, of a particular 34 amino acid motif. And it's, oh, they're almost identical repeats except for amino acids 12 and 13 of these repeats. And so they'll go HD or NG, NS, NG, et cetera. And eventually it was realized that these are DNA binding proteins and they bind um, these, these motifs here specify which of the uh, nucleotides in DNA uh, the effector binds to. So if you've got an HD here, it binds an A, an NG here, it binds a T, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and, and there's a crystal structure now of this effector that's shown wrapped around DNA here. I mean, it's a spectacular structure. If you look down the DNA molecule, you can see a, a sort of pinwheel uh, uh, type effect. And what these do is they turn on genes in the plant that render the plant more susceptible. So these are transcription factors injected from Xanthomonas by type 3 secretion. And what do they do? They go in and they make the plant more susceptible by making, in, inducing the um, expression of proteins such as these proteins, the sweet proteins. What are sweet proteins? They are sugar transporters. So basically what the pathogen can do is to impose on the host um, elevated expression of sugar transporters that pump sugar out so the pathogen can grow. And uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an additional twist, um, you can actually now engineer these tau, so-called tau effectors, transcriptional activator-like effectors, such that they bring in, uh, you attach them to nuclease domains so they cut DNA, and you can drive them so that they cut DNA within the promoter of one of these sweet genes, and one of the results, what results from these cuts is you get um, deletions uh, in the promoter and then you can end up with a plant that's more resistant because the plant has lost the capacity to be activatable by that particular uh, uh, tal effector. Uh, <coughs> right, so, so plant pathogens make all these effectors. The role of the effectors is to shut down uh, host defense. Uh, or they render the plant more amenable to um, uh, being colonized by the pathogen. Um, so how come plants aren't wiped out? That was my little sege from two slides ago. Uh, and that's because plants have evolved the capacity to recognize effectors. 
as a trigger to activate defense. So this is the second layer of plant immunity. And it's called uh, uh, often effector trigger immunity, or ETI. Um, and so plants carry these proteins, that are nucleotide binding, leucine rich repeat proteins. Uh, they bind ATP or, GT, uh, ATP or ADP uh, in, in this nucleotide binding domain here. Uh, they've got leucine rich repeats at their C terminus, and that region is, is, uh, is almost certainly involved in the recognition uh, of the molecule from the pathogen. And then they, have, they come in two main different flavors of, of signaling domain at their end termini, uh, either a tear domain or a coiled coil domain. Uh, <coughs> so these resistance genes can be very effective. So this is a, a, a GM field trial we did 2012, I think this one was. Um, so we, we'd cloned a resistance gene that encoded one of these uh, NLR-type receptors from a wild relative of potato called Salon venturii, put it into uh, um, oh, might have been Maris Piper, uh, and, uh, and lo and behold, we've got a resistant plant. This is now a field trial, as I say, natural infection, whereas uh, the SIBs that had not been transformed, uh, well, you can see what happened to them. There's not much left of them. But I told you about the boom and bust cycle. If you just have one resistance gene in there, you're actually making it relatively easy for the pathogen to make a mutation uh, in, in the recognized component uh, and then overcome uh, this resistance gene. And basically, there's, there's no magic wand to wave over this. But um, we, we think about it sort of probabilistically. If you can clone a lot of different resistance genes and put them in the same plant in a so-called stack, then instead of having to mutate in the, for the pathogen having to mutate to overcome one resistance gene to grow, it's got to make three simultaneous mutations in three different recognized effectors. Uh, and that stack should therefore be more durable. Uh, and uh, we're doing a field trial with these plants uh, this year and uh, next year and the year after. So we'll see how it goes. Now, I, I mentioned this boom and bust cycle. If resistance genes only last three years, you know, and if they're that useless, how come they, they stick around? I mean, why are we still lumbered with these useless uh, genes? And, and the answer to that, I think, is in the fact that um, in, plant path in plant populations, there's normally tremendous genetic heterogeneity. So if you look at a field of wheat out there, uh, as you're driving here, you've got millions of plants that are genetically identical. But a more, and, so, and, and that's represented on the left here as uh, <coughs> plants where the, uh, you've just got the one red resistance gene. They've all got the same resistance gene. Here you've got five different resistance genes that recognize five different effectors. So you've got a mixed population uh, and you're going to have very different consequences uh, for any epidemic. So uh, let's say this plant here uh, develops disease, you know it's going to end badly. And uh, lo and behold, uh, this field is toast uh, very quickly. And of course, that's what would happen in our crops were, we, were it not for fungicides. But if you've got a plant here that's infected, then quite apart from anything else, it's further epidemiologically to the next susceptible host. So the whole epidemic uh, of, of, uh, um, of that particular race of the pathogen on this a uh, mixed population of plants uh, is going to be slower. So they are effective, but they're not, um, but, the, but the, any particular resistance gene is amenable to being overcome uh, by mutations in the pathogen. So in wild plants, uh, especially in outbreeders, you can have a lot of diversity in pathogen recognition capacity, uh, as in the human major histocompatibility complex. Um, <coughs> in plants, you've got tens to hundreds of resistance gene loci, and many of which uh, come in, in, in uh, sets of alleles with different recognition capacities. Um, and so this diversity in, in natural populations is key to uh, effectiveness of resistance. Um, because each pathogen strain is going to be likely to be poorly adapted to most of the individuals in the field. So at the very least, you're going to have uh, less of an epidemic. But what we do have in wild populations is a rich source of new uh, resistance gene alleles that could help crop disease resistance. And, and now, we, now, we, now we're faced with a sort of a tactical question. Um, how do we game evolution here? What's the least bad way to game evolution? Of course, you know, it's like antibiotics. Antibiotics are great. You know, your kids got, needs antibiotics. You treat them with antibiotics. But if everybody does that uh, with one antibiotic, then 
the antibiotic loses effectiveness. So you need to manage uh, any resistance mode of action you're working with to maximize its durability. Uh, and of course, I showed you the, the wonders of having a mixed population genetically of uh, uh, resistance recognition capacities, but that's not much good for seed companies who want to sell you know, uh, bags of seed where, everybody's, uh, where all the individual uh, plants in there are the same. So I think we're left with stacking as the best way to uh, improve on the boom and bust cycle that previous plant breeders have wrestled with. So what are these resistance genes? Um, what we've got here is more alphabet soup, um, but the point of this is that both plants and animals have NLR type uh, proteins. They've all got this um, ATPase domain variously called ENACT or Embark domain, and the plants are just the Embark domain. Uh, various signaling domains at the end terminus, different sets of signaling domains at the end termini of these uh, animal genes and various other uh, uh, motifs too. I just want to mention this one that's called a caspase recruitment domain uh, and highlight the NIPES and NLRC4. Because um, what's been shown is in terms of the mechanism, uh, mechanism of those two proteins, uh, NLRC4 uh, is a, uh, 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 let's say, a downstream signaling component that has these uh, uh, NACT, uh, et cetera, domains and caspase recruitment domain. It's normally auto inhibited, but when the NIPE uh, detects molecules from pathogens. One of them is actually flagellin. It has a conformational change, which means it activates uh, the NLRC4. And then this, once it's activated, it interacts with other NLRC4s, and you get this uh, uh, a chain reaction, essentially, where you have uh, 11 or so uh, NLRC4s in this, this beautiful uh, uh, configuration, which has been studied by cryo-electron microscopy, and the structure uh, defined. And the result of this is you've got, if you start with a monomer with a caspase recruitment domain like this, um, nothing's going to happen because you need multi copies of the, uh, this protein domain to recruit caspases, which then hydrolyze proteins and hydrolyze themselves and uh, send off a chain of events. But this caspase recruitment domain is at the end terminus of this, and here you've got something that uh, is chock a block with caspase recruitment domains that recruits caspases. And then you get, and then something happens. So we're guessing that something similar uh, happens in plants uh, for plant resistance proteins, plant NLRs. Uh, but you know, we can draw cartoons that look like this. <laughs> uh, so this would be this would be the off form, coil coil uh, uh, or tear in Bart domain, leucine rich repeats. Uh, there's a molecule that it recognizes an effector, it changes conformation, and and something happens. Um, but actually, how plant NLR proteins work is a complete mystery, uh, which is one of the reasons I still get up in the morning, because I'm quite excited about trying to figure out how they work. Um, now, something I need, do need to tell you is that plants, uh, that, that these NLR proteins um, can either recognize uh, uh, a pathogen directly, so here's a resistance protein, recognize an effector, stuff happens, or um, I, I've told you that these effectors recognize uh, or interact with, with molecules that participate in plant defense. And actually, we know now that some of the resistance proteins are monitoring the state of these targets of, of uh, effectors from pathogens. And they are only activated when, it detect, when they detect a change in the virulence target that is effector dependent. So either the effector is recognized directly by the resistance protein or indirectly uh, because the resistance protein is monitoring the effects of the effector rather than the factor itself. So I work uh, with these two uh, proteins, which work as a pair, RPS4 and RS1, uh, the tier class. And the interesting thing about this class is that um, at the C terminus, it has a protein that is not normally seen in a resistance protein. Um, it's a DNA binding domain of a worky transcription factor uh, family. And worky transcription factors are uh, transcription factors that play a key role in activation of uh, plant defense gene transcription. Uh, mutants in workies are more disease uh, susceptible. Uh, so why on earth is this worky domain sitting in the middle of a resistance protein, actually or near the end of a resistance protein? Um, these two genes, RPS4 and RS1, uh, they're right next door to each other in the genome, and uh, they're each defined by the effector that they recognize. Uh, and for this one to work, it needs this one, and for this one to work, it needs this one. So they're, they're, they absolutely have to work together. 
And we now know that, is that they form a complex like this. Um, and what the, uh, uh, what's going on in this complex is that when effectors show up with these names, uh, whose job it is for the pathogen to um, interfere with the function of working transcription factors, so for example, POP2 acetylates the DNA binding domain of its working transcription factor, so it can no longer bind DNA, it just doesn't work anymore. So um, the plant has evolved uh, these, these sort of complex receptors that enable it to know when a pathogen has showed up that is messing with, a, with worky transcription factors. Because when the action of this thing on workies, it can't, if, because that's what it does, it can't avoid acting on this worky domain that's in the resistance protein. And the changes that ensue upon that recognition or that interaction activate defense and you get resistance. So it's very cute. It's like judo. You, know, you use your opponent's attack uh, as your defense. And it turns out there are a lot of proteins like this. Um, so uh, RS1 and RPS4, I've just mentioned, there's this worky domain here. Here's a pair from rice that recognize effectors from rice blast that hit this domain. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a nice analysis of this. It's called the integrated decoy uh, hypothesis. So this worky domain acts as a decoy that, that um, enables the uh, uh, action of effectors uh, to be drawn into action on something that when that action happens, defense is then activated. Uh, and um, this is pretty interesting because these R gene pairs like this are very good at working when you move them from one plant species to another. And so something I'm really excited about at the moment is this uh, uh, grant that I have called Immunity by Pair Design. And what we want to do is to understand the design principles of this complex and then also to, uh, if we figure them out well enough, to design in the capacity to respond to different effector uh, actions. So can we put some other domains in uh, where the worky domain is and enable, um, build a complex that enables us to detect the, the action of different kinds of effectors that hit different kinds of domains. So, um, so just to sum up, um, so there's various uh, uh, representations of this. There's, there's two different kinds of representation here. So uh, maybe I'll start off with this uh, uh, cartoon. <coughs> you've got fungi or, and um, you've got, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they, they make molecules they can't help making that are detected by cell surface receptors that activate defense. Uh, they, and, and bacteria and fungi pump in these proteins called effectors, whose job it is to interfere with this. But the plant has evolved the capacity to detect some of these effectors and then uh, result in effector-triggered immunity. And so we, sometimes you, I like to represent it, uh, it's a bit like the uh, Z scheme for photosynthesis. Uh, so pattern-triggered immunity activates defense, you get, that's your PTI, but effectors trigger susceptibility. So these effect, this cloud of effectors here can drag down the level of activation of defense. So then you've got um, susceptibility. But then if one of them is recognized by a resistance protein, uh, then you've got elevated uh, defense, you know, higher amplitude of defense, and, that's the, uh, and that gives you resistance. Uh, and there's, this, is, this is not just um, fungi, uh, oomyces, and bacteria do this. It's clear now that nematodes, aphids, uh, 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 also make effectors whose job it is to interfere uh, with host defense mechanisms. Um, so this is another cartoon of it, and so I work at the Sainsbury Laboratory in Norwich, uh, and um, we have a great set of colleagues, uh, Cyril and uh, Saskia work, uh, Susan and, and Zilka work on the uh, cell surface receptors, uh, Sophia on effectors, uh, and also on resistance proteins. Uh, this is uh, um, Matt and uh, Peter, and um, yep, and this is my wonderful team at the Sainsbury Lab at our um, uh, Christmas. Uh, event. And uh, I'd like to thank these entities for funding, particularly Gatsby, obviously. Thank you.